everyone, we ask you to please rise for opening prayer and pledge allegiance. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day you have granted us. We thank you for your goodness and blessings that you shower us, your great love and mercy and care. Forgive us when we do not show gratitude and thanks. Renew our spirit that we will strive to do what pleases you will. We thank you for the many talents, knowledge, and gifts of our employees. Thank you for each one of their lives as they provide results for our constituents. We ask you to meet their needs. Give each one a sense of satisfaction for the important work they perform. Lord, we ask you to be with those that are suffering this month from breast cancer. Touch and heal their bodies from all cancer. Restore their health completely. Comfort them and remove all fear from their minds and replace it with faith and strength. We pray that during this month, awareness will be circulated so many can receive early detections of this horrible disease and receive immediate help. Let, us to be, let each one of us be support systems with an open ear, a shoulder to lean and cry on, and a pillar of strength and prayer for them. Father, we continue in constant prayer for the health and wellness of all our communities. Heal those that are afflicted, sustain and provide strength for those that are caring for those that are ill. Lord, we ask you for your guidance in our meeting this morning. These things we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pledge of Jesus to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll convene the commissioner's public meeting at this time. Ask for approval of the 
minutes of the previous meeting. I move to approve. Uh, second. All there's aye. 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 Carry. Comments on public uh, comments on agenda items only at this time? Yes, yeah, online. Anyone from the audience? Are you hearing none? Um, this week, uh, for our informational series, county departments and what they do for you, we have uh, Mr. Ed McCoy from APL. Good morning, Commissioners. <coughs> Chief Ed McCoy, Lycoming County Adult Probation Office. Um, <clears throat> the mission of the Lycoming County Adult Probation Office is to protect the community, serve the courts, and rehabilitate the offender. The Lycoming County Adult Probation Office strives to achieve excellence in community corrections public safety and public service throughout the integration of evidence-based practices. The Adult Probation Office collaborates with law enforcement, courts, victim organizations, and community-based organizations to provide a unique blend of enforcement, enforcement, justice, and treatment. The Adult Probation Office aims to offer and extend services to, the, to address the probationer's criminological needs and empower them to become a productive member of society. Uh, currently, uh, we have 27 staff in our office, three supervisors, 16 officers, five probation aides, and three clerical staff. We supervise a total of 1,800 people right now um, in Lycoming County, ranging from ungraded misdemeanors to felonies. That's all I have. Ed, can you yes, sir. tell, I think it's important for the public to learn about the fact that by statute the state is supposed to be helping to fund these, and if I'm incorrect on the statute part, let, let me know, but that, that we've really seen a reduction in assistance from the state. Can you sort of explain that? <coughs> sure. Um, the way the criminal justice system is going now in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, it's putting the burden on counties and county taxpayers. Um, the state is supposed to fund us 85% of all of our salaries and to assist evidence-based practices. Right now, um, I can give you a total. Um, from the state, we get $161,000 um, to support our office, which is minuscule. Um, we have about a $2.5 million budget. And the reason I bring that up is because the we certainly know that crime doesn't just stop at the ends of the border, right? I mean, we know people are coming from out of state and from within state uh, with with uh, uh, you know cocaine and heroin and fentanyl. Uh, we know a lot of it's coming by truck. Uh, when I was when I was in the legislature, we heard testimony at hearings about how it came up by truck, and so I think that. One of the reasons I asked you to point it out is that if the state really wants to uh, deal with the problem of crime, it's got to take a, a holistic approach and recognize that um, communities that are poorer or richer shouldn't be the basis of how much we put into offices like the APO to try to rehabilitate, to try to keep people safe. So it came to about 27%, right, is what you said? Yeah. So I would urge constituents to, to bring that to the attention of some of their elected state officials and see what we can do to improve that. Yeah, and, and I'd like to say that, and I don't know the exact figure, but I know it's in the 200,000 range of what counties supervise compared to the 30,000 the state board supervises. So you can see where the burden is on, on the counties. Thank you. Thank well, you as, we, your as we do this informational series on uh, each department throughout the county, uh, we have tremendous staff in each department. I had the honor of working with, with Ed and, and uh, with the staff as, a, as an agent and as a deputy chief for 32 years. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things that the state has, has done that needs to be looked at. Um, they dump our state cases on us. They supervise 19% of all probation pro clients in the state. The county supervises 81 percent, yet they get the majority of the state monies. Uh, what they just talked about is a state law. It was, it was there 30, 35 years ago. It's supposed to be 80 percent. 
it is a law. Third, 80 percent is to be coming back to the counties for funding. When I left three years ago, it was down to 26 percent. Now I think it's down in the teens. So they continue to cut the funding, uh, even though it's a law. And this is statewide. It's not just like Cumming County. Um, they're responsible for DNA with, on each <coughs> misdemeanor case, it's uh, misdemeanor one or any felonies. It takes about an hour and a half, two hours to do one. They do swabs. Uh, they do the fingerprints. It's a $250 fee. None of those monies are returned to the county. Everything goes to the state. Yeah, we do the brunt of the work. Um, we talked to them about that, and that's another um, disservice that the county's not being re reimbursed on. So there's a lot of things that the state needs to take a look at and fund those monies back to the counties uh, to providing services because they supervise the majority of cases that are released from pr prisons throughout the state. And Ed, I want to thank you for you and your staff. You do tremendous work. Uh, during COVID, um, they increased their contacts fourfold. Um, they were going from 1,000 contacts to 4,000 contacts uh, by going out and seeing clients at their homes, walking into dangerous situations, uh, not knowing if there was COVID in that home, and yet they're making sure that the services weren't disrupted. So thank you for leading me, Bill. Thank you, Commissioner. And your staff. And I did uh, his remarks. Um, as you take a look, as you take a look at the amount of money in the criminal justice system that we put into the system and um, all the diversionary uh, programs that we have and yet you still see the crime and you still see the DUIs and you still see this and you still see that and if there's one thing that you believe we could change to, to you know, steer that into a different direction Ed, what would that be? And I know you touched base on it, um, where they're going out and being more active out in the streets versus having them come into our department. Uh, what, what would that be? Well, I think what's, what's effective is when you have uh, smaller caseloads and you can help the individual in treatment or whatever rehabilitative needs that they need, but when you have officers supervising, you know, 100, 120 individuals, um, unfortunately, you got to pick and choose who you're going to monitor. And a lot of people go to the wayside. Um, <clears throat> Evidence-based practices, the reentry service center, I mean, we've seen a lot of gain. Um, obviously, um, cost taxpayer money, but we do see a lot of success um, through recidivism. Um, drugs. <laughs> You know, drugs are the biggest problem, you know, unfortunately. Um, you know, we just got through a uh, heroin epidemic, you know, five or so years ago. COVID hit. Heroin wasn't coming in the United States as, as much as it was prior to COVID. So they turned. They go to fentanyl, go back to cocaine. Um, what that answer is, Commissioner, I have no idea. Um, but you've got to try to rehabilitate the, the addict um, because they're going to do whatever it takes to get that drug, unfortunately. And a lot of that's crime. When you see the open border policies that America has currently, is that a major contributor to the amount of drugs that are on the street? Well, personally, I, <laughs> I think it's an absolute disgrace. Um, that we have open border. Um, who knows what's coming across the border? Um, I can only tell you from what I see on TV, there's been an increase in drug trafficking um, since the open border happened. Um, that's horrible. You know, I don't, I don't know any other country in the world that has, has that policy. I really don't. And especially, you know, the issues that are coming. Um, I feel bad for those law enforcement officers down there on the border. Actually, my son has a friend that's a border patrol agent down there. And um, they're so um, undermanned. Um, he's working seven days a week, 10 hours a day, if not more. Um, he, he said, you know what, TV doesn't really even show what's, what's occurring on that border. So. Thanks for everything you do. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to introduce my new staff, Angelina Missigman. She just started yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Angela, come on up. <laughs> Put you on the spot. You know you're going to have to be working with a tough crew. Yeah. <laughs> I already set up a little alarm this morning, so. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, okay, so my um, educational background, I went to Bay College for two years, and then I transferred to Towson University in Baltimore, or right outside of Baltimore. Lived in Washington, D.C. for about 12, 13 years. Moved back here. Um, sorry, moved back here um, due to family uh, situations. I'm currently raising nieces and nephews with my husband. So my background is HR payroll, and um, looking for a home. Hopefully, this is my final stop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nice Welcome. to have you. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Chief John Stolbeck is here. Yeah, don't be recruiting. Yeah, what she said, payroll. I know, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to see if you want to have lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Nice to have you. Nice to have you. Thank 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 you. Moving on to 2.0 accounts payable cash requirements for short with free employment. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm here to present the cash requirements report for invoices due through October 27th, 2021, to be paid on October 20th, 2021, in the amount of $976,575.01. And this week, only approximately 29% is taxpayer funded. Okay. Almost half is RMS portion goes to grants and other sources. Brandy, you, you said 575.01. The, the sheet says 751. Oh, $976,751.01. Sorry. Okay. No, that's all right. I just want to make sure I didn't Yeah, that's good news. Almost half is coming out of the revenues from the landfill, which are not taxpayer property tax money. And when you look on the first page and you're just touching base on this topic, uh, you see the pass through DUI collections. And they, it's just a little, probably about $74,000. And is that something uh, annually? That's monthly? something normally we do every quarter. It's usually between twelve dollars and $17,000 every quarter. But it had fell by the wayside. Um, I think the last time they were paid, I want to say, was through June 2020. So we owed them like a year's worth of payments. So yeah, we're just catching back up. But normally that would be on there every quarter, and it's half of what we collect in fines goes back to West Branch. Yep. Thank you. I move to approve. I'll second. I'll Aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. TDA actions with Roxanne Grusho. Good morning, Roxanne. Good morning, commissioners. In the public defender's office to reclassify the first assistant public defender position from a pay grade 13 to a pay grade 14. In facilities management, the addition of three maintenance three positions, pay grade seven, eight. At the prison, reclassify an administrative specialist position, pay grade five, six, from a seven and a half hour day position to an eight hour day position. And finally, at pre-release, reclassifying an administrative specialist position, pay grade five, six, to a clerk three, pay grade four changing that position from an eight hour day to a seven and a half hour day. Yeah, I want to address the facilities management. Um, they do a tremendous job throughout the county. Uh, these aren't just maintenance workers. These people have construction backgrounds. They do electrical work. They do uh, plumbing work, um, HV, HV uh, air conditioning systems, heating systems. Um, they're, they're skilled laborers, and uh, they're hard to find these days. Um, 
very hard to find and they're expensive, especially after COVID. Right now, hire a contractor right now, you're probably gonna be waiting about six months to get a contractor. Ken has two openings right now uh, for the people that have left. Um, he has 574 work orders behind. He is currently working on um, Solomon's building, Magistrate Solomon's building. Um, when he gets done with that, he's here to do the rebuild for the Sheriff's Office, which has been waiting for two years, which is on the third floor right now. If you walk over there and look in the Sheriff's Office, you'll see it's all tore up. Um, if we stay on the pace we're on now, that won't be completed for a year and a half, and he's across the street. Uh, we have, um, our will is to sell this building within the next uh, six, well, six months to a year. We'll be moving across the street, Third Street Plaza. Ken will have to do the move, take us over there. Uh, the new owner's not gonna give us six months to get out of here. So we have to make sure that we are our planning's in place for that. Uh, we also have uh, juvenile probation, which has been upstairs. They won't be moved back to August of next year, and they're just about done. So they have more, I can keep going on. They have more on their plate than they can handle. So we're giving him three additional staff, laborers, so that we can get this work done. If we were to farm this work out, we'd be paying good billion wage. To give you an example, um, when we were working on Solomon's building, we had a gentleman who took another job in another location, another county. Uh, he took great pride in what he was doing. He's a very skilled electrician. He wanted to complete that work. He was willing to come back as a subcontractor to do that work. If we were to pay an electrician, if we could have got one, he'd be starting from scratch. For prevailing wage, he would be paid between $90 to $100 per hour. This gentleman came back and was able to complete the work at $35 an hour. So these are things that we're faced with moving forward. Uh, we want to make sure our buildings the courthouse has not been updated since it was since it was built in 1970, and slowly it's getting rebuilt and done over. I worked over for 32 years. Uh, we had our carpets changed once in 32 years. Um, the, the place was you just moved walls. Nothing was being done. We had leaks. We had all kinds of things going on over there. Boards of commissioners are starting to make sure that that building lasts for another 50 years by doing the renovations. These are skilled laborers that are saving taxpayers hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. We appreciate their work. Uh, we're gonna post these positions, hopefully we vote on them today here and approve them, and then we'll move forward. But we wanna explain to the public why we're doing what we're doing. I just wanna correct the statement that you made just by mistake. Yeah, that they're not actual laborers, they're, they're skilled. They're skilled laborers. Very skilled. Very, very skilled. Uh, they, they have to be disciplined in so many uh, different skill sets from drywall and electricians, plumbing, but they, they must be able to handle all those needs. Uh, and I'll just reiterate the fact that, you know, this department not only saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars, it saved us millions of dollars. And when you take a look at prevailing wage, uh, you know, you're talking an electrician, you know, is $46 an hour plus a, another $20 in fringe. You know, you're looking at 65 to as high as uh, $95 an hour when we bring people in that are skilled like that. Um, and I think even your, your laborers will run into the mid-40s. So that department is uh, instrumental in not only uh, the cost savings that it provides us, but in, in getting the jobs done. You know, these are these are major facilities that that need uh, tender loving care every day. You know? yeah, those work orders, those 574 work orders are behind. They're just everyday things. That was a thousand just last month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had pulled he had pulled his entire staff off of different projects. He was trying to get those caught up, and um, so it's it's a, it's a challenge for him. And I believe in the future, you know, in the next few meetings, uh, we'll be seeing adjustments uh, that the commissioners must take action on uh, from many different departments uh, within county government. Uh, how many 
open jobs are there, Roxanne, right now that we have not filled? Mm -hmm. Probably a good 30. A good 30. And we're not the only ones that are experiencing this as well. Uh, and we have to take action. Uh, our, our hands are kind of like tied, and, and times are changing, that's for sure. You know, in some of these other um, positions, the, the public defender is um, a situation where the first assistant public defender is really a very important role. I mean, they're all important, but the person who's doing the homicide, the person who's certified to do homicide, the, the person, you, you can't just walk into a courtroom as a lawyer and do a homicide. You have to have certain credentials. Um, uh, other kinds of major felonies, serious uh, felonies and so forth, and the ability to teach public defenders who are often coming right out of law school um, and be able to mentor them. So uh, it is a change in the position, um, and as Commissioner Masser said, some of these things is that in the reality, if you try to go out into the market and look for people that meet the need you have, then, you know, you, you end up paying the rate that uh, is going on. Um, you know, I concur with my colleagues, none of us are thrilled about adding new positions, but um, the pressure on Ken George, who's the Director of Facilities Management, uh, it's to, to, it isn't just that he has to go out and do, uh, uh, you know, fixing a problem in our facility. He's, they're literally building uh, the Solomon Building. Um, and one of the advantages of, of having an in-house situation like that is that when there are changes that come down, whether out of necessity, so for example at the courthouse, when we see things that require more security, we don't have to submit change orders to a contractor. We don't have to rewrite contracts. Um, in the prison, that really is an effort by the prison to save money. Um, and and the, the reclassification of that to an eight-hour day is simply because the person had been working an eight-hour day. But what the prison was able to achieve, uh, uh, the warden and, and this particular individual, uh, They've been able to cut back on one of the positions that uh, would be paid at a higher rate, and that person is picking up additional work, uh, and then uh, having work on a new position sort of downgraded. Uh, there isn't anyone in that position yet, but when it's hired. So it's an effort. I think all of our department heads uh, try, they really try to keep the, the cost down and work as efficiently as possible. But I, I think, as Commissioner Masser said, you, you will probably see changes in the next couple of weeks coming uh, from departments. Um, you know, having 30 openings isn't necessarily a good thing because it means that um, people are constantly uh, having to train new people, then try to get back to the project that they worked on, for example, in the planning department. That person leaves, they've gotta go back, retake over the, the material until we get a new person and then train that person. So it's uh, it's something that we're trying to see if we can't avoid. Okay. And, I, and I think if the public could only see the amount of time we put into personnel uh, every Monday, and then the department heads coming to us, uh, you know, it's it's better. This, you know, nobody wants to add personnel, uh, but what we're what we're seeing is. Uh, an incredible amount of need. I mean, when you're down that many people, uh, you're working some people six days a week, double shifts, and and they're getting tired. You know, uh, our planning department, as I'm looking at there, you're down a tremendous amount of people, and that is not good for our county. Period. Uh, because we do so much for other municipalities as well. I look at the three new additional man, uh, maintenance positions that for the facilities management. Uh, it's, it's cost effective. It's saving us money. Um, it's like you said, they, these these guys have saved millions over the years. So it's, it's money up front, but it's savings in the long run by what they're doing, what they're accomplishing. It's saving the taxpayers a tremendous amount of money. And we have, you know, the last board we started, we were at 552 full-time positions. We got down to about 532, I believe, sometime during this board. Between the actions we took in the last board and this board, we've been able, that 
those reductions saved us about $1.6 million a year. So, you know, when you save that every year, but as commissioners, my colleagues said, we, you can't just uh, run a uh, organization on a shoestring. I mean, so some of it is strategically selecting. And the competition's difficult. We had a fantastic employee, fantastic employee, who got stolen away by the state, who basically was paying her probably- Almost double her salary. Almost, yeah, like 30%, 40% more. It's about 40%. 40% more than what we could pay. and. Um, and it wasn't like we were paying the minimum wage. I mean, it was a $42,000 a year job. Um, and hats off to her. I mean, we're happy for her. Absolutely. But, you know, obviously it's difficult to, to compete um, with that, so. You want a motion? Yes, please. Okay, I'll move to approve the TDA actions read by the director. I'll second. All fair side. Aye. 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 So carry. We'll recess the commissioner's meeting this time for the salary board. We need salary board this time. Okay. Commissioners in the public defender's office reclassifying the first assistant public defender position from pay grade 13 to a pay grade 14. In facilities management, the addition of three maintenance three positions at a pay grade 7 8. At the prison, reclassifying an administrative specialist position, pay grade 5 6 from a seven and a half hour day position to an eight hour day position. And at pre-release reclassifying an administrative specialist position, pay grade five, six, to a clerk three, pay grade four, and changing it from an eight hour day to a seven and a half hour day. Okay, is the chore with us? Uh, Nikki's here. Okay, good morning, Nikki. Good morning. Okay, any questions or comments on these positions? Here and can I have a motion? I'll make the motion. I'll second. All favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Nikki. Hi, thanks. Commissioners, um, can I just ask Roxanne a quick question? Absolutely. Um, on the personnel actions next, I see the transfer station, um, Jeffrey S. O'Connor. Can you confirm that's the same one that retired earlier this year? He is filling the position he left, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I need to know that for retirement purposes. So, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Okay, we'll adjourn the sorry board actions at this time. We can be in commissioners' public meeting. Under personnel actions today at RMS at the transfer station, Jeffrey S. O'Connor, full-time replacement truck driver, pay grade six, sixteen dollars and seventy-six cents an hour, effective November first, twenty twenty-one. In the courts, Janine M. Mastraco, full-time reclassification as a scheduling technician, pay grade six, $16.76 an hour, effective October 31st, 2021. Okay. So is our understanding Mr. Connors coming back out of retirement to go back to work? Or? I, I, don't I don't think, think he was here uh, very long. It wasn't retirement. I don't think retirement. he's been retirement. I think it's um, just a retire. retirement. Retirement. He's a retire. Yeah, he didn't retire. Gotcha. All right. Any other questions? No, just to note that the RMS is paid out of the revenue to the RMS. And I'll move to approve the personnel actions. A uh, second. All fair side. Aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you. 6.0 informational items. Uh, we'll start with Maya Tune. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, the item I have before you today is just to announce that we are going to be requesting um, bids for the timber uh, improvement projects and working in coordination with Larson Design on that. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the second informational item is a presentation uh, by Eve Adrian. Is this your last presentation with us? Yes, sir, it is. Oh. You can't <laughs> but, talk in. <laughs> but I am doing a presentation for the Conservation District Board on Wednesday and one for the Planning Commission on Thursday. Thank you. Again, thank you for everything you've done for planning. Thank you. It's Best my wishes pleasure. To you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my name is Eve Adrian, and I am the Natural Resource Planner and the CAP Coordinator for Lake Cumming County um, for only a few more days. <laughs> 
Um, I, along with a core team of staff uh, in the Planning and Community Development Department and the Lycoming County Conservation District, have been coordinating a countywide Clean Water Action Plan, also known as the CAP. Today I'll be discussing what the CAP is, how it was developed, what kind of projects are in it, what the goals and the benefits of the plan are, I'll discuss next steps, and then we'll wrap up with some statements from some of our closest partners who worked on the plan. But before I get into the details of what the CAP is, I wanted to talk about some of the problems that farmers, landowners, and municipalities in this county face regularly. So farmers have probably noticed that the price of fertilizer has soared since late last year, and the rates are predicted to stay high for the foreseeable future. Add to that the cost of managing erosion on farm fields. Our county has experienced more and more severe rainfalls over the past several decades, and the unfortunate reality is that without mitigation, farmers pay the cost of these intense rain events because soil has value. And when soil erodes from a farm field, that's dollars washing away. So it can take years to replace what can be lost in just a single storm event. Landowners. Based on data from the National Flood Insurance Program, Flood restoration from damage caused by just one inch of flood water in a 1,000 square foot home is estimated to cost over $10,000. The estimated total cost of property damage from 2010 to 2019 in Lycoming County was $37.1 million. Damage from 2016 alone cost an estimated $26 million. That's a lot. Municipalities. Municipalities must prepare for and respond to heavy rainfall event events, which I stated before are increasing in intensity and frequency. With inadequate assistance to pay for these events, municipalities must often use funding sources that are limited and highly competitive. Potential solutions to all of these problems are outlined in Lycoming County's Clean Water Action Plan. So what is the cap? Essentially, the CAP is a bottom-up, voluntary, and collaborative approach to meeting state-level clean water goals. The PA Department of Environmental Protection awarded Lycoming County $50,000 for our first year of planning with no match required. Additional money is expected for implementation, um, and currently there is a grant route open that we will be applying for to help implement some of the, plan, uh, some of the projects that are in our CAP. Please note that this plan is not regulatory, it is not an unfunded mandate, and it is not a plan to increase taxes. We plan to use grant money to fund all of the projects and programs in our CAP. So the CAP was developed collaboratively over the last nine months with over 150 individual stakeholders, including federal, state, and local governments, nonprofit groups, colleges, and other environmental and conservation entities. DEP, conservation di district board members, and local farmers were deeply involved in the planning process alongside our core team of planners who comprised of Lycoming County Planning Department staff and conservation district staff. The projects identified in the CAP were selected by, stake by the stakeholder group based on their potential for reducing nutrient pollution either directly or indirectly. Projects that work toward reducing pollution include specific goals like implementing forested buffers along streams or reducing fertilizer usage. Initiatives that help to reinforce these projects include coordination efforts, education, outreach, and training. Improving reporting and project tracking is also called out as these efforts improve planning effectiveness and efficiency. And if anybody knows anything about me, I really like government efficiency. <laughs> And finally, policy and regulatory changes are identified as they can help to systematically reduce nutrient pollution. Part of our CAP also included identifying the resources we would need to implement our plan. These include things like additional staff, equipment, funding and incentives, education and outreach materials, training, and engineering. After calculating the value of these resources, our total upfront cost estimates are $36.7 million. While this number may sound staggering, it's important to remember how much it costs to react to pollution and flooding after it's caused a problem. By being proactive, we can, in fact, save money in the long run. 
Also, none of these proposed costs will be funded by Lycoming County and will be sought through grant funding. And if you have any doubts about the cost savings of um, any kind of uh, natural flood mitigation pollution reduction strategies, this is just a sampling of some of the case studies from around the country that just look at green infrastructure cost savings. Not looking at farming, BMPs, just green infrastructure. So if you would like to do some light reading, I have some for you. So our cap would, uh, would reduce our current nitrogen pollution by 46% and our current phosphorus pollution by 39%. And while all of these initiatives work toward the goal of reducing nutrients in our local waterways, the benefits of our plan also include improving local water quality, reducing flooding, enriching partnerships, supporting farmers, bolstering the local and regional economy, leveraging funding opportunities, and avoiding regulations and higher costs for compliance. So next steps. Lycoming County's CAP implementation phase begins October 2021, so we're in implementation right now, and it will continue into 2025. We'll continue to seek grant funding so that you can see the benefits of the CAP in your communities as soon as possible. And you can stay engaged by visiting our webpage at lyco.org slash CWAP. There you can find a comprehensive list of our projects, planning materials, meeting information, newsletters, and stakeholder resources. Now I'd like to pass the mic on to some of our partners who have worked closely on this plan development. Um, if the folks who'd like to say a few words want to just line up here, and then we can do kind of like a rotation, that'd be great. I'm Matt Long. I'm the district manager for the Lycoming County Conservation District. We were pretty heavily involved in the development of the CAP. Uh, Eve was a great resource to use. It really helpful with that. All the planning was. Hey, Matt, could you just, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're speaking the mic. Thank you. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Um, most of the district's involvement will mainly be through the agricultural outreach that we have always done and will continue to do. Uh, our, ag to, uh, our ACT technician is here who can actually pr talk a lot more about that. Uh, I'm sure the district will be involved in other things as well with our watershed specialist program and maybe even some of our dirt and gravel roads program. But I'll let Tim talk more about the portions of the cap that uh, involve ag. Okay. Thank you, Matt. I'm Tim Heitler. I'm the agricultural conservation technician <coughs> at the Lycoming County Conservation District. Uh, we have applied for a cover crop grant to fund cover crop implementation on farms and that includes a portion of that money towards a no-till drill. We already have a no-till drill that we rent out to farmers and we have quite a bit of use of that. We're trying to expand the fleet, expand our offering to farmers. With that, uh, we have in hand $500,000 of grant money that We've applied for and leveraged from other sources to do barnyard and manure storage <coughs> structures on farms, which are part of the cap. And uh, we have applied for an additional 500,000 in grants and, and grant money leveraged to do those same projects in the next few years. So we're gonna be pretty busy. Thank you. Thank you. Cam Coons, I'm one of the directors of the conservation district. I also have a small farm uh, outside of Lairdsville, a, a cash crop and beef operation, but it's part-time. Uh, but I became involved uh, for two reasons. One was I wanted to make sure the farmer was treated fair. I, we can't go out and dictate to farmers what we have to do. We have to talk with them. We have to find that grant money to help them. I mean, poor dairy farmer, there's no way that he can spend tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands on, a, on manure storage. It's not there for him. So we have to, to work with the farmers uh, and, and, and work the right way with them. 
that, that they're going to buy into the program. Uh, and the second reason I became involved, being a director, I wanted to see how much time that the conservation district was going to have to uh, be involved. And we've made some changes uh, with some of our programs. So starting next year, the one employee will be, I would say, 90%. Would you say that? Matt, yeah, ninety percent involved with CAP, so we have dedicated uh, one person almost full time uh, to, to work with that. So, uh, twenty twenty five is a short a short time span <laughs> to find the grant money to to uh, to do what. But what we want to do it's a, it's a it's going to be a, a goal that I feel is going to be hard to hit, but I will work, the, the conservation district will do their part to to do what we can to, to make it work. So Ken, I, I do have a question. Um, so we heard that there was what, 36.7 million in need uh, and that it's uh, solely going to be funded with grants and what happens if we don't meet our goals or expectations? Uh, they were not mandated, correct? Yeah, it's not. It's not a mandate. Maybe no, you can. You know, I don't we just, We're just going to fall that price tag because. Yes, it's, it's a I lot. mean that <laughs> is uh, that is the comprehensive amount of money that we've estimated for just the one time. So if we were going to say one year one, we get all of our needs met. Some of the costs that are in that spreadsheet that you should have for those cost estimates are a yearly expense. But just for that single year, that's including everything that we would possibly need. So, yes, that's, the, that's everything plus the kitchen sink. And I know the state's working on some of these things too. Uh, Senator Yaw has a, a bill in uh, with like the Chemlons, the True Greens that they have to be held responsible for what they put in people's yards. Yeah, he mentioned and, that the other night, the farmer's um, yeah. bureau's uh, annual right. I mean, the, mentioned that bill. The, according to the, the book that DEP gave us, I call it a book, Grappus and Miller Run are the most polluted streams in Lycoming County. That's not farms. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's going to take the whole county different, just not farms, but everyone to, to reach our goals. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Good morning, Brett. Good morning. My name is Brett Taylor. I am a full-time farmer and I'm also on the Lycoming County Planning Commission. I got involved in this at the beginning because I was fairly scared of where this could go. Um, I would like to commend Eve and Shannon, Matt, Greg before him. When we started down this project, we could have opened up a can of worms because they pretty well wanted you to put a wish list together of anything you wanted. Never going to be mandatory, but what could you do if we could give you all the money in the world? And I was really scared of where this was going to go because if we'd have come out and said we can do this, 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 and this, we could have easily got to 150 million. And they could have easily come back in 2025 and said, well, you guys said you could do this. Now we want you to implement it. And that really scared me. I mean, as a farmer and as a taxpayer, we could have went for a big ride on this deal. We kept our heads grounded. Eve did a great job keeping the projects. One of the biggest things we talked about with Tim and Matt, what are projects that we're already doing that if we added a little bit more value to, we can get guys to buy in and do? Cover cropping, no-till, some of the things that Cam touched on. We didn't want to go out with a wish list a mile long on every project because they would have loved us. Some of the, the higher scoring points were five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar projects one at a time. We were trying to figure out where we could take that money, put it to better use, and make it pliable because the, in, in my mind the program with the wrong staff was set to fail before you ever got started because you could have went out there with a wish list a mile long and then they could have said to you, what are we going to do now? You said you could do it. It's 2025. We want it done. And by the way, we don't have any money left. So like I said, with, with the staff that was here, I, I got to commend them tremendously because I went into it with a, with a little bit of a nervousness to me because then the next thing they do is they come out and regulate the farmer 
or the landowner and say, well, your government said you could do this, so we really need you to step up to it. So. You know, uh, I want to thank you and Cam, you both, I mean, obviously the staff are, are fantastic, but, this, but the volunteers like you and, and Cam Coon, who just spoke, are extremely important. I mean, without your input, the staff doesn't have the knowledge and the day-to-day -day experience that you have, and they are committed to working and representing you and doing all the things you said, but your involvement was very important, so I really do want to thank you for doing that. One other thing I'd like to touch on on that is how far ahead Lycoming County is to the other counties that are in our group. I talked to a couple neighboring counties, and they're not anywhere near, but by going ahead further, they keep opening up these grant opportunities to a first-come, first-served basis. If you have your plan approved, that lets you apply. If you're not approved yet, you can't apply for these grants. So the staff really did come ahead and, and got us to the front because one of the biggest reasons I got into it was one of the things that the state was talking about when it came out in Lancaster is to make more CAFOs, more confined animal. That was their answer to it. If, if we can't make this happen, then we will regulate harder and when we will just make it happen. So it's just a little nerving. When did you come on at Planning Committee? Five years. Five. This, is, this is my fifth year. Yes, my fifth year. And, and I know Brett, I've been over to his farm. Uh, big operation. Uh, but what I, I, I admired about you is the fact that you want to challenge authority in government uh, to make sure that they were practical. Uh, in, in not only the things that they'd like to see implemented, but you know, the regulations as well. Uh, and, and you were valuable, uh, valuable person that we placed on that, that commission. And, uh, we appreciate your service. And how is your daughter doing? Better. We'll go with better. Okay. We'll go with better. She, um, she got sprung into a pretty big area. When you when you end up in Penn State main campus, it's a little bit big and a little bit overwhelming. So we'll go with better. Well, she's she's a great person. She she will be very successful. Thank Her you. Daughter is the like Cumming County Dairy Princess. Was <laughs> was before she started college. Brett, right, we want to thank you and Kim for your common sense approach. Well, like I said, we we had more to lose. Cam and I had as much to lose as we had to gain. You know, let's face it, there's as much to lose in this as there is to gain. And thank you for you guys allowing the better staff that we have to, to work to the front because we could have gave the world away. And, you know, I know we often don't want, I think we should say hats off to the state that they, they came up with an approach that was educational and that was an effort to get voluntary compliance. And the reality is that we need that kind of education because. Um, even if I, I think of an analogy with the levy, where for 50 years we haven't done anything to maintain the levy. I mean, we've done. I, I don't want to misspeak. We we haven't we haven't done. So so I think it is good that the state took this approach and that um, that the staff were able to work with with citizens. You know, um, I'd like to touch on that a little bit. Part of the problem we have is when we started this, and this is where I struggled right off the bat. They started giving us these numbers, Graphius Run, Eastern Lycoming County, all this, and we said, okay, we would like to see some water sampling. And they said, oh no, you dare not use water sampling, you have to work off of modeling. So the state was moving the goalposts back and forth on us a little bit because they wouldn't let, one of the things that we had talked about very early on, every school in Lycoming County has a environmental science program. How about we have the kids start a water monitoring program? And the state said, no, that's not good enough. We, we don't trust their work. We go off of our model, not off of actual data. So I, I'm a little bit concerned of if we wouldn't have our plan done, where that would have ended up. Right. So. They wouldn't even Thank accept, you. they would not accept Dr. Zimmerman's water testing. I mean, he's the best in the state. Right. But it was the, it was the consistency. I think the way I understood it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's, because the data that is used for the modeling and the, the type of um, pollution reduction baseline is because it was a 10-year model, a 10-year monitor that was, that was monitoring the water quality. So it's a USGS monitor, there's two of them in the county, and the different tiers of data is 
determined based on who's collecting, how long the monitor's been there, and other factors as well. And it sounds like DEP is going to open up a little bit and allow for those different tiers of data to be incorporated. But yeah, unfortunately not necessarily change the, the load reduction baseline that they will be using. So, so yeah. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Megan Lehman, and I'm the Community Relations Coordinator for DEP's North Central Region, which is based here in Williamsport and covers 14 counties. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll quickly address what you're saying. Um, we can always point up, right? So um, you guys can point to the state and say the state is making us do this. Well, I think that one somewhat we can point up towards the feds. Um, because there are federal, uh, you know, requirements and, and guidelines with, with what we can use in terms of uh, data that's considered acceptable for uh, TMDLs and things like that. So, um, but yes, I think that is definitely an ongoing conversation and an important point that like Homing helped push forward during this process. So, um, so j on behalf of DEP, I, I just came over here to, to congratulate like Homing County on the finalization of the, of this plan um, and to thank the staff at the Conservation District and the Planning Department for all their hard work. I know um, Eve will be leaving us soon, um, so I just want to say on a personal note, it was a pleasure to work with her and get to know her a little bit, and I discovered that she has a love of dilly beans, so my parting gift to you is going to be my personal secret recipe, my canning recipe for dilly beans. So, she <laughs> um, I, I, I have to say, I worked with two counties, and we had, I think, five or six staff members that divided up the counties in our region to be the regional leads or point point people for DEP. Um, so we were kind of the liaisons between central office and the counties. And I was uh, grateful that I got to work with Lycoming County. I obviously had, in my past life, had done some similar work, um, older, older versions of planning, everything old is new again in the Chesapeake Bay world. Um, so some of what made like Homing County stand out in the planning process, and, and I'm going to share this is from myself and also our, our Bay office in Harrisburg, um, drawing together a diverse and impressive <laughs> stakeholder network. I think you said over 100 people, um, which was really impressive. Cons uh, watershed groups, um, MS4s, agriculture, everybody. Um, a laser focus on local priority issues and watershed needs. So keep coming back to what does like Homing County need? How, do, how can we make this cap intersect with our other priorities, such as flood abatement and uh, flood mitigation and uh, uh, compliance with other regulations, um, improving our quality of life? These are things that um, you're just so good at synthesizing together. Um, and finally, a, a really sustained effort at public outreach and involvement. Um, nobody in Lake Homing can, County can say that they didn't have an opportunity to make their voice heard as part of this plan. Um, so again, uh, I was pleased to be part of the effort, although I have to say most of my role ended up being, I took Eve's questions and I said, let me ask central office. Many questions. Many questions. And, and they were grateful for the questions. Um, and there was never a doubt in my mind that Lake Homing County would rise to the challenge um, doing this plan. So moving into implementation, I know we, we heard some pretty big numbers um, dollar-wise, and I think we, we asked for an aggressive timetable. I think realistically we all accept some of this implementation is going to go past 2025, but if we keep at it, uh, things, things do happen, time moves quickly. Um, so DP will remain at the table as a partner in funding, um, technical assistance through our uh, North Central Stream Partnership here, which we're very involved with locally and other efforts. Um, and, and to that end, I'd like to share an update regarding our local team. Uh, we are going to have an, another change. I know a few weeks ago you recognized Marcus Cole, who, who left as our regional director after, I think, nine and a half years. And we are soon going to be uh, losing Dan Vallello, our local government liaison. Uh, he's going to be retiring sort of toward the end of the year. Um, and I, I can say, unlike the gentleman on your, your salary board action, I don't think we'll be able to get him back out of retirement. <laughs> So I'd like to introduce Lisa Mead, um, who is going to be training right now and, and taking over for Dan. And she has previous experience working with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and Department of Aging and also in private consulting. Um, she is a Clinton County resident like Dan, but she's just over the border, so you can call her a neighbor. Okay. Um, so we will be here with you. I'm excited to see the cap roll out and continue improving Lycoming County's water quality. And uh, thanks again on behalf of DEP. You know, when, you, when, I, when I came into office, 
you were one of our planners. Uh, uh, yes. And I think uh, you were instrumental in the mutual credit programs, right? Yes. That w Mark Davidson and I and Christine Weigel worked uh, very heavily on that for a number of years. So. Rod Morehart as well. There again, you, you're, you're working for DEP now. Yes, and, yes, sir. And that's what happens so often in, in county government. <laughs> uh, we, we seem to produce some, or we have a, a unique ability to hire great people, and then governments, other governments come in. <laughs> I think I should but, say thank you to that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. and please, would you like to come up and introduce yourself? <laughs> and Dan, of course, you've got to have thank some party you, orders. <laughs> Matthew, is that allowed? Absolutely. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I have big shoes to fill, so I'm learning. Uh, my name's Lisa Mead, and uh, I worked in Harrisburg 10, 15 years ago. I actually worked with Commissioner Mirabito when he was a state legislator on some a few things. Um, I'm really happy to be back in state government. So, thank and Lisa, you. Lisa, you did a great job with the uh, educating representatives uh, in your position as the legislative liaison, and I have no doubt that you'll do a similar great job here. So bringing all that experience with you, I think, is also going to help, help us. So welcome. Don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. <laughs> well. My name is Dan Vallello. I'm the local government liaison for DEP. Uh, I guess I can start off by saying it's been a pleasure working with this board, and and it's been a pleasure working with most of the other boards over the last 17 years. I have to, I have to clarify that most of them. Um, but again, as Lisa's stepping into this position, um, our role is to make sure that your constituents have a voice when they go to DEP, and when they're trying to muddle through all the regulations. Uh, again, Lisa will be a great contact to, to help you understand, your, help your constituent understand what, what's going to happen. So uh, as, as Marcus Cole just left, uh, this is going to be a good, Lisa can be a good uh, communicator to the, our regional director, uh, assistant regional director, who is now the regional director interim, uh, Jared Dressler. So Jared uh, will be there for an unknown length of time, but he will definitely be an asset to us as well because uh, he's been here for as long as I've been here. So he, he definitely knows like coming county. And if I must, if I might just digress for a minute, as a former county commissioner, I just, I just want to applaud you. That, what a great meeting that I've been here for a few years and the information you start out with, with the, uh, that's great that people can learn what county government's all about. I think that's a fabulous, uh, that you bring to the table here. But also, the, the facilities positions as a county commissioner, I, I can't applaud you enough for doing that. And I know it's hard to bring on additional staff, but again, uh, your constituents should be proud of the fact that you're doing that and making making it work. And finally, I deal with 14 counties and I'm on, involved with all the CAP programs. And, and I've said this to many of you, Lycoming County has always been a leader in, our, in the North Central region. and. Uh, you continue to be a leader no matter what project like Cumming County takes on it is always top-notch in the North Central Reach so and that starts with good leadership so uh, again my pleasure thank you Dan thank you for kind words well Lisa uh, we're losing two phenomenal uh, supporters you know when Marcus left and now Dan uh, I you know DEP gets a, a bad rap many times. Sometimes I'm uh, accused of saying that. A lot of times from you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, uh, so, but what's impressive is that um, both of those leaders, Dan and Marcus, they, they were with our community every step of the way and they had a, a sense of community. They had a sense of understanding, okay? Uh, we, our people don't have open pocketbooks. It's very difficult for our farmers. 
and uh, I can't I can't say enough about Dan because when we go to association meetings and it's not just the county commissioners but you know people are having issues this guy was always there and he he listened and uh, I'm not sure how many times you've um, totally helped okay but I can say Is that this. a compliment <laughs> <laughs> I can say this uh, that if he wasn't there uh, he, we would not have been uh, put in the same position I put it to you that way so Dan you were a friend of our county as well and uh, we appreciate the service that you provided us and, and DEP. It, it is a regulatory agency that is absolutely necessary so that you know our streams are, are clean and our waters are clean. Thanks you know, Dan, Dan I'll, I'll follow up with my, my colleague, and, uh, but I'll be a little more direct. When I was in the legislature, when I've been a commissioner, you've always been there, even I'm thinking a month ago when I called you at 8 o'clock at night about a constituent's... Uh, I remember that. And do you remember let's that? Let's not do that, because that was my personal phone. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what you did is that night you got, uh, you got connected, you got me connected with the person who needed it, and it was a time-sensitive thing. And, and uh, that's the kind of behind-the-scenes work that public servants, that state, county, federal employees do all the time. That people don't realize and uh, I appreciated that the com constituent appreciated it and uh, it's something that you've done for 17 years and, and I want to thank you for that and um, you know when people have a problem our job as elected officials is to try to help them solve it and and you you did that uh, you did that and uh, it meant a lot to them so uh, I hope you enjoy your retirement and know that you're always uh, welcome to come and watch these exciting meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I'm going to add, hey, just one oh, thing. Oh, <laughs> You're allowed. You're going to be allowed to take a bottle of water from us. Oh, that's true. I, I never stop. <laughs> <laughs> but only water. Only water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. I just wanted to um, say that I privately thanked all the stakeholders involved in this process, but I want to very publicly thank you all again because there is no way that we would have been able to actually complete this without stakeholder knowledge and input because this was a learning experience for me. And so, you know, especially the farmers, um, you know, thank you for your patience and the teaching me and explaining to me these different things that we had to put in our cap and why it was important. I appreciate it very much. So thank you. Thank you. Also, I'm going to leave you with this light reading material. You'll like. <laughs> <laughs> we'll enjoy it, I'm sure. I put a little sticky notes and stuff. You know, just to follow up with what Dan said, I mean, the involvement, Eve, of all these people that you mentioned, you know, we're all just here on this planet, right? And then we go on. And the question is, do we leave it, we, do we leave it better? And what the farmers have done in terms of this program and I think back into the 1960s when the, the, the pollution alongside the highways was unbelievable. People just threw, 1963, people threw everything out of their car windows as they were cruising down the interstate. And if any of you, I don't know if you can remember it, it was unbelievable. Lady Bird Johnson started the campaign, right? Today you don't see that. But more importantly, there's a cultural change where people understand that no we don't want to do that and I think part of what this cap program is to try to make a cultural adjustment in our understanding of how floods happen and what we can do to not only prevent flooding but as you said Eve soil has value I mean that was very very prescient and I wrote it down because it's really true for those of us who are not farmers we don't think soil has value but soil is everything the farmer has so it is something that I think we can all be proud of and that Hopefully we pass something on to the next generation. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Let's move on to action yep. items. Yep. 7.1, Roxanne Brito, uh, voting on policy 611. Commissioners, we're looking um, at a revision to policy 611, which is our smoking policy. I'd like to table this motion for a later date. You move to table? Yeah, I'll second. Yep, all three side. 
Aye. And I think you want to table it to try to get back and try to get more input? Is yes. That? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 7.2, Maya Toon. Good morning again, Commissioners. Um, the item I have is to vote to award the information to bid for collecting housing renovation um, project to Elijah LLC. They were the sole bidder, um, and they were the most responsible bidder at $55,000. And this is a 100% grant reimbursement for this project. Okay, any questions? Motion accepted. Move to approve. I second. Vertically challenged. <laughs> I, I have no idea. Okay. Yes. So seven point three is to vote on amendment to agreement with GTL. Um, this is an active contract that we currently have for the prison for inmate telephone. This is just to extend that agreement for an additional term um, until November 30th, 2021. Okay, any questions or comments? Hearing none, have a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All three side. Aye. Aye. The next item I have is to vote the award for a request for proposals for printing and absentee ballots and mail-in ballots. Um, based on looking at um, all of the documents and also talking with Forrest, it was decided that we would proceed with NPC Incorporated, which is a different vendor that we're currently using. Um, but it's my understanding that there was conversations that um, was held with the director um, on Friday. Um, I had Forrest reach out to Matt to talk with him. Um, and Forrest and I are on the same page, so with all that being said, I think we're ready to proceed with, with um, the contract process. Was um, this vendor just as uh, qualified? I mean, you checked out all, all of the credentials and-, and Yes, Commissioner, mm -hmm. they, they were number two on the list. Obviously, we um, enjoyed the services from David A. Smith printing it just the way that it's been. Okay. Well, what's the amount gonna be? Um, the cost is for him, I think it was a dollar, six, dollar, um, yeah, dollar, um, 64. And the total cost per voter to, um, to assemble was a dollar and 11. And then the, um, first class pre-sort postage rate is, um, 48 cents and cost per page to print full is, um, 0 0.05 cents. So, which is giving you that total cost of the one a dollar sixty four. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. And I don't know if you're interested, but you know the David Smith, who we currently have, was at a dollar seventy nine. So there is a obviously a savings associated with that. Any other questions? A motion, sir. I move to approve. A second. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 7.5, Scott Kramer voting on uh, to award RFP for Royal Broadband Deployment to Windstream. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Scott Kramer from uh, uh, City Council of Governments. Um, I'm asking the, uh, we are asking the board for action on awarding uh, Windstream LLC, uh, the Lycoming County project area of the four county uh, broadband expansion project. The counties involved with that project are uh, Lycoming, Clinton, Union, and Northumberland. Uh, Union County is the lead applicant on that project. They uh, petitioned or uh, put the application in the ARC where a, uh, the vast majority of these funds are coming from. Um, we also uh, received uh, funding from uh, RACP. Uh, that in conjunction with some uh, EDA CARES funding through CDCOG, we were able to secure roughly $2 million per county for this project. And could you just explain what this is all about? Yes, Commissioner. Um, this stems all back from a, a project we did back in 2018. Uh, it was the four county uh, feasibility study that uh, was funded in part by uh, the Appalachian Regional Commission and the individual counties. And that study we, we commissioned um, was looking at all aspects 
uh, broadband within those four counties. And one of the main things that we found is those trouble areas and um, dark areas that are in need of broadband. Uh, so that kind of snowballed into the implementation project that we petitioned uh, ARC for, which is basically going in and funding the implementation. And we took the, the route of, instead of, um, you know, counties or CEDACOG or, or some other uh, uh, public entity uh, building the broadband infrastructure is what we found is that the ISPs really like to be involved with that and because to prevent overbuilding and just keep the infrastructure the way they need it. So what we did was um, we, we did an RFP process where we selected these problem areas, we gave the ISPs uh, requirements as far as speed and amount of uh, people and businesses to uh, uh, provide service for. We received back, uh, for Lycoming County, we received back two uh, proposals, one from Windstream, one from Loop Internet. Um, we went through a scoring process and we found that uh, Windstream was the better candidate. And what is ISP? Internet I'm sorry. <laughs> ISP is an internet service provider. You know, we had a lot of public input on this. We had meetings over at Trade and Transit 2 where we had um, constituents who were affected by it as well as people who just feel that it's important to get uh, internet service and providers. We had some ISP providers there, local and others. So. Uh, that's really great. We'll, I, we should thank the Appalachian Regional Commission for coming up with the money uh, to do the pilot study because what it did is it brought together four counties who probably on their own may not have taken this on. Um, also, do you can you give us any, you know, we talked a while back when the American Rescue Plan money first came out about a large sort of project for North Central PA through CEDACOG in terms of trying to get internet uh, service. Do you, has CEDACOG have any other thoughts about that or I noticed we, I don't know if the deadline is coming up or if it passed I, I I keep reading about other areas of the country that are putting proposals this is for the mega right we've, we've looked into that unfortunately with a lot of the funding that's coming through the federal government it's basically geared toward the provider themselves we've been excluded like as a public entity um, from applying for these funds um, now there's no reason why we can't uh, help providers and point them in the right direction, which we're planning on doing, and to acquire these funds. Okay. Um, so like the, the, the ARLOF or the FCC auctions that just went on uh, a few months ago, um, and I, I believe they're going to have some more rounds of that as well. A lot of money coming down from the federal government for broadband. Yeah, thank you. Two things that, that have been identified out of COVID is it's really been red flags are the true need for internet. We've seen that as a result of schools, work, and we have an opportunity in Lycoming County as, as people are moving out of the cities. Uh, they're tired of the crime, they're tired of the taxation. Uh, we're, we're within three to four hours of six or seven major cities. And uh, we have an opportunity to attract those individuals here. Uh, more and more people are working from home. Uh, that was identified out of COVID. Uh, office space isn't as, as neat as it once was. And if a business can work from home, those individuals are willing to relocate. And one of the first things they're asking the realtors is their broadband in that area. They need it for their work. So that's a necessity for the infrastructure going forward. And we've talked about this, broadband has been identified it was, it was an issue before, now it's really a big issue as we see more and more people with relocation, schools, and um, the fact that you can work from home. We appreciate the work. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mary. It's definitely a major need. And commissioners, I'd just like to note, like next week um, on the agenda, you'll see the Union County Subrecipient Agreement that kind of ties this all together. We need a motion to vote. I'll move to approve the awarding of the RFP to Winston LLC. I'll second that motion. All there, aye. 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 Security. 
Leslie Kilpatrick, voting on agreement with Marco Incorporated. Good morning, commissioners. We're asking your approval today to um, purchase or do the buyout for the lease copiers um, that we did in 2019. Um, Maya and I have been working, um, and I worked with Brandy to try to come up with the funds this year. She'd rather find them this year than next. Um, so the total would be $39,948.51, and that would um, purchase then nine copiers. So these are copies we've been leasing, we're now at a point with the lease that we can buy them out. Correct. Yep. How much expected life do you think we'll get out of Oh, we're hoping at least eight years. Oh, great. If not ten. If not. And there's no additional cost to buy these out. We're not losing money. I know no. that people think, you know, with leases that we you know, lose money as a result, but there's no, there's no default or anything associated with the buyout or a loss of funds. Yeah. I'll move to approve. I'll follow that. Uh, Thanks, commissioners. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Lauren Strasser is on the on the line. Um, this is to vote on amendment to agreement with Green Chip. Lauren. Good morning. Good morning, Lauren. All right. So this amendment is to extend our current contract with Green Chip with for our electronic recycling. Um, it would go until December 31st, 2025 with the same rates of reimbursement. We've been working with them since August 2020 and recycled about 270 tons of electronics. And these are the electronics that are through the CDRA, which is the Covered Device Act of 2010. And that includes the televisions, the computers, and the computer accessories, which include uh, keyboard, uh, mice, and desktop printers. They have been a great company to work with. They're very responsible and responsive. Uh, they have quick transportation and turnaround, and um, they're very quick with their payment for the reimbursement. Uh, and we would like to continue working with them, uh, and that is what this amendment is for. Okay, any questions? Lauren, can you tell the public if they've got a TV or a computer that they want to get rid of, what should they do with it? So this program is just for residents of our service area. So if they have a TV or, um, or a computer, they can bring it to the landfill location uh, in Montgomery to recycle it. We used to accept it at the transfer station, but we have discontinued that for the time being. Um, handling this equipment is very labor intensive um, and is a safety hazard as well because um, these TVs are very heavy. Um, we rely on um, pre-release to help with this operation and um, so we had a limit bringing it over from the transfer station to have it just at the landfill so if they want to bring it here it is available for free so there is no charge no fee for the resident to bring it here um, this does not include recycling um, electronics for businesses or institutions okay thank you I have motion I'll move to approve. I'll second. All aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Kennedy voting on the purchase of three new sonograph machines. Morning, Commissioners. Jerry Kennedy, Director of Information Services. Uh, earlier this year, we brought you the purchase of three stenograph machines for the court reporters. Uh, budget and Finance has asked that we purchase the remaining three this year uh, with funds that are available in our budget. Um, total cost of $15,435. Okay, and that's a budget of item? Yes. Okay. It's coming out of budget funds, yes. Questions? Comments? A motion? I move to approve. Not the fair side? Aye. 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 Thank you. Commissioner Comments? Yeah, I have a couple. Scott, you, you want to go over what we're doing with the ARP money? Yeah, um, we have received 11 million this year. Uh, we'll receive 11 million next year for a total of 22 million of the ARPA funds. Um, the commissioners have developed a strategic plan moving forward. We initially met with the um, township supervisors, the borough council people, uh, the city of Williamsport uh, to hear what uh, their needs were and what projects they had in their areas going on. Um, if we could help them with other funding sources, 
or whether we could um, partner and try to levy levy some of our money, leverage some of our money um, with their monies. Um, we had about half of the uh, uh, we heard, and we had three nights of meetings with the uh, municipalities of those elected officials. Uh, yesterday, we met with all the water and sewer authorities uh, throughout the county to talk about infrastructure and the projects they had uh, in their their regions, and um, we met with them. Our next step is to meet with the uh, the realtors and the realtors associations uh, about infrastructure, uh, whether it be new construction, old uh, rehab construction where they can fix up older homes. And uh, then there was a suggestion yesterday by the sewer and water authority people to meet with the home uh, owners, the realtors, because they'd like to be on the same page moving forward. So we'll have an additional meeting with them. Uh, then we're going to meet, meet, meet with the farmers, the conservation district, uh, to see what we can do with the, uh, the farmers in the area, how we can assist them. Um, and then also we'll be talking to the early childhood people um, about um, their needs and the other entities before we decide. How to move forward with the monies? We have to have them allocated uh, by 2024 and spent by 2026. So we want to bring everybody to the table to see. Uh, our, our goal is not to spend money, but to invest this money. It's a one-time deal, and it's so important that we invest the money in the people of this county moving forward. Um, yeah, we. You know, it's interesting because so many organizations are coming to us now, uh, whether it be nonprofit or, you know, the authorities or whoever, and very difficult decisions that we have to make with the use of this uh, $22 million. Um, but it was interesting. I went and talked to a, a group of people. There was about 22 of them there uh, this week. And um, after breaking down the categories in, in as far as our allocation plan, uh, they basically said, forget about the rest of the people. You need to protect, you need to protect uh, our community's levy system because this is going to cost a ton of money. So the most important was the levy and infrastructure. Those will have the longest lasting effects on our community and it's hard to argue it's very difficult to argue with those comments which will lead me into um, reading a couple emails from the city of Williamsport and uh, attending our board of appeals assessment appeals um, we got an email from the city that they lost probably 430 um, over four hundred thousand dollars in assessed values, and that's that's a lot of money, uh, so far, to this date, um, and it's happening right and left. We're we're seeing school districts having to take uh, uh, newly purchased homes to appeals, okay, and what what that does, and typically they're winning, okay, but what that does is that it 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 gives an imbalance of taxation and our job is to make sure that, that that balance is fair and equitable no one just because they sold their home should end up paying twice as much as their neighbor in a very similar home this is uh, the inequities of our, our assessment are getting more and more prevalent um, just in one facility alone uh, the Lycoming Mall, which was, I believe that was valued at uh, $44 million not too long ago, within a decade. And they'll probably win the next appeal, uh, which will bring them probably below $15 million. That's a tremendous amount of taxation that's going to have to be spread. And, and that brings me to my point is when we're looking at a reassessment and you know I I'm not yeah, uh, it won't benefit me trust me okay but it needs to be done and when you see businesses in the brick and mortars today 
You know, it's not like yesterday. People are online, and 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 you're starting to see that when they appeal their taxes, they're winning. And um, we we have what they call common level ratio. That common level ratio right now is 61 percent. We believe it next year it will be 50, 50 I mean 59, 58 percent. What does that mean? So if you're willing to open yourself up to an appeal that if the board or the courts find that your appeal is justified, then they'll get a reduction of taxes of currently 39%. That's the law. That's the statute. And what do we have to do then? And I'm, and I'm not talking just to county, school districts, municipalities, cities. We have to spread that loss to other taxpayers. And unfortunately, some of those properties are owned by the elderly. Um, this is a very difficult time. Uh, and we see more and more appeals. So. I think that the commissioner is going to have to have a serious conversation about putting this back on the table. I believe we have to do a tremendous amount of educating uh, be before we make those decisions. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're, we're going to have to, to deal with this challenge. It, it's been since 2004, it was the last reassessment that, that the county had. And think back to then. We've had, and this may be a very unpopular comment with some people, but I'm not here to be popular. We have nonprofits that are truly profits in our area, institutions that are out for profit, and they've bought up properties. And they've bought up the prof those properties, and we're not getting the taxes for those properties because they've either been torn down where they've been turned over to that institution. And that's a real issue when it comes to taxation because that taxation's been passed on to the mom and pop that are next door. The store is trying to maintain on a string shoe budget. It's not fair to them. And, and I, I have to add that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be cutting services or government. You know, I don't want to say that we just spread all the cost to the taxpayers. But in reality, as we meet with our constituents, you know, here's the favorite saying, well, cut, just don't cut mine. <laughs> right? Can't cut my service that's needed. And we deal with this on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So, and, and in many cases, they're right. I mean, we have no options. You, you need to fund them. So, you know, a lot of times it's mandated by the state and the federal yeah, government. Yes. Those services are mandated. We don't have a choice if we do want to cut them. You know, on the reassessment, we really have to decide whether we want to just put this up and, and vote on it because it's going to take, if we voted on it today, I think it would still take us three years before it's actually finalized because there's a waiting list with the company. Yeah. There's only a couple of companies in Pennsylvania that do reassessment. So, we have to actually get on the waiting list, and then once we get on the waiting list, it's going to take them a certain amount of time to do it. So uh, it's probably something we ought to really think seriously about discussing and figuring out what the next step is towards moving on that. Um, we've had that recommendation from our, our assessment office, and uh, I, I've been contacted by constituents. And I, I think the example you gave is very good of what happens when a house is sold and so forth. When you look at uh, you look at the reassessment, the cost. There's also another. We we've implemented over the past boards of commissioners and this one software programs that um, interface with different departments, so that we made the transition one when, when we do a reassessment much easier. Um, there's also another tool that uh, I believe we're one of six or eight counties in the state that do not use that spectrometry. Right. 
and when you see the advancement in in that uh, specific field where they go over and take photos of everything in Lycoming County and then it's just amazing uh, the data that they can receive you can measure a house with just a flyover you can see so many different things it's another tool for law enforcement to you know if they're if they have to engage in a rural area they can get on this and and look to see where they should be you know uh, entering and what uh, spaces that could be you know an area that people could be hidden so uh, the tool is is pretty impressive from what I saw I don't believe what we acted on it but it's it's something that would also help the uh, reassessment as well as law enforcement and, and others you know our, our planning department as well would be able to utilize that uh, service no Yeah, yeah, yeah. I brought, I brought it back. You know, when you take a look at it, it's a grizzly bear, not a black bear. I know. I don't, 